Hi, my name's Terry Simpson, I'm a surgeon. And one of the things that we discovered a number of years ago doing surgery on weight loss patients was how people who are obese are, have gluten issues that they didn't know because the classic gluten intolerant individual that we were taught in medical school is this thin little person who loses weight and we showed that it's not that at all and there is a lot of morbid obesity as a result of gluten issues. Um, I'm Nicole Hun. I am a gluten-free blogger and cookbook author. That's it. <laughs> no big discoveries. Great <laughs> yet, at least. I'm Jenna Drew, Miss New Jersey International. I became gluten-free when I was diagnosed with celiac disease in 2009. So it's not really a choice to eat gluten-free, but I do it every day. I'm Rosanna Wyatt. Um, I'm a gluten-free foodie, I guess. Um, I have been gluten-free for about three and a half years, and um, I, it started as a journey through when I was trying to get um, the food changed around for my husband's diet when he was going through cancer treatment. So I decided I'd do something for myself at the same time because I was going through some issues as well. So now I'm feeling better, and so is he. <laughs> Great. So, um, uh, Dr. Simpson, maybe it's easier if you kind of uh, drive the questions here, but maybe you could um, first just tell us about some of the research and findings you've found in your practice? Well, one of the things about weight loss surgery is we get to see guts. And it turns out everybody up on the panel here loves guts and blood and things like that. We love your guts. We actually <laughs> wanted to do, <laughs> do and I, offered, I offered to biopsy her here on the panel. I thought, that if, I thought that if Jeff could do it one-handed, I could do a biopsy <laughs> of her gut. Two-handed. Two-handed. Yeah. So, well, anyway, one of the things about doing weight loss surgery, or certain of the types is, is that we have a little bit of extra uh, gut left over. So I started biopsying all of these individuals when I noticed that there were a number of weight loss patients who after surgery had these horrible problems and we would put them on very specific diets and all of a sudden they cured up. And when they would cheat, all of a sudden they would have all these horrible problems again. Malabsorption, vitamin B, you know, iron, potassium, calcium, everything. So we started looking at those biopsies. And we started seeing that all of these people had classic biopsy signs in their distal small bowel of gluten intolerance. So then we started biopsying all of these morbidly obese patients who were coming through as we were doing surgery on them. And we found an astonishing number of them. So then we started working backwards and saying, what, what, what were the foods that they, and we're gonna talk about that later, but what were the foods that they were eating? And why did they get to where they were. And then one of the things that we discovered is the foods they were eating was stuff to keep them alive because they were, they were morbidly obese and malnourished. Mm -hmm. And they were malnourished because they couldn't absorb anything in their small bowel. They were starving, but they stored fat because they would eat high gluten things that would give them energy for this long, and then they would burn out and they would store a lot of fat, but they wouldn't store a lot of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So our journey and our focus in our practice then has been a lot of what you do, which is let's teach them how to cook. Mm -hmm. Really? Really. We just <laughs> met, so I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> really well, tell us a little bit about what you write and why you started writing. Um, my son has celiac disease. He was very, very sick um, in, his, in the second half of his infancy. Um, and we, you know, once we learned what was going on with him, that was, by now, almost nine years ago, and I didn't even know what gluten was at the time. Um, I just felt like I want my son to have a cupcake, which is, I would imagine, not what you're going for <laughs> with your patients. But all the same, I didn't want him to be able to eat cupcakes all the time. But my, my patients do usually they, eat a lot of. They do like yeah, cupcakes before surgery. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll have to think on that. Um, but in any event, I, I often, I would imagine actually that. When people find that they can't have something, they cannot have something, like for example, I'll have readers tell me, you know, I've been, I haven't had a fresh donut in, you know, five years or something like that. And before, I didn't even care about donuts. But just the idea that they couldn't have it, I think the more choice you feel like you have, especially in a society like ours, where you're, we're used to having so much choice, I would imagine that, or at least it's been my experience, that you can regulate yourself more readily 
when you don't feel like anything other than gluten itself is completely out of reach or whatever other foods you, are, you find that you can't tolerate, um, that your system can't tolerate. And so my feeling is I don't tell people whether or not to be gluten-free, but once you decide that you are and it's a big tent, I don't care why you're gluten-free. It could be because you're diagnosed with celiac disease, which is sort of like the gold standard, right? Like everybody the, understands. The villi. The villi. <laughs> I, everybody understands that you have to be gluten-free. And then all the way down to you just sort of feel better. You feel more clear-headed. Whatever your reason is, I feel like you should be able to do it and have it be pleasurable and allow you to be social with the people in your life so that it doesn't get in the way. I, my aim is to just remove it as an impediment. Mm -hmm. Well, and how, how do people feel differently once they embark on a gluten-free diet? I think often they feel isolated from, from other people and from themselves. And I think that, at least for me with my son, one of the biggest early barriers was family members who mm -hmm. refused to accept the fact that he needed to be That's very strictly gluten-free. Yeah. The biggest That's one is family issue. members, mm -hmm. um, like outside the... It, your immediate family because they don't understand. They say, oh, it's okay, you can just have this little bit. Just has a little bit of gluten. No, you don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if, you ever, if you ever want to see, you know, uh, if, if anybody's ever wondering if you really have an issue with gluten or not, and again, you don't have to be <laughs> gluten-free because you think it's cool. If you really have a problem with gluten, you need to be gluten-free. It's not a choice. Completely. Ask her. She'll tell you where she was. She'll tell your story in a second. The bottom line is, is you go gluten-free for two weeks. Absolutely avoid it. Look at every label. Start cooking yourself. Don't work it that way. You don't have to don't worry about yourself. labels. Well, don't, well, you know. I mean, Hannibal. We talked about that earlier. A lot of, there's not, you know, the cannibals have no gluten problem. Okay, that's the cannibal. Mm. But the bottom line is two weeks, and then try one week thin. And trust me, if you have celiac disease, within a very short period of time, you will feel, on one week then, feel miserable. It's much cheaper than having me biopsy your gut. But and you know, we can do it too. on stage. <laughs> but you had, a, you had quite an experience with that yourself, about how, yeah. Yeah, um, I was diagnosed in 2009 with celiac disease, and I, was, I had the gene panel done in 2007 after my mom had been diagnosed. And I found out I had the gene. I was kind of in denial, thinking I had no symptoms. I just had the gene. And you can actually have the gene, but not have celiac disease if it's not turned on. Um, but looking back, after I moved to New York City, right after I graduated college, I was you know, kind of living on that Roman noodle budget. But I walked enough, so you know, it, I felt like I was still being healthy. And there was a morning that I could not get out of bed because I couldn't take the pillow off of my head, that my migraine, I had such a bad migraine. And within that week, it lasted an entire week. I could not go to work. I couldn't leave my apartment. And I lost about 10 pounds in a week. And I was pretty close to where I am now. So I was not a lot bigger than this. To lose 10 pounds was very, very significant. And I remember the morning I picked up my phone and I, I called my mom and I said, don't tell me. I told you so, but I have celiac disease. I need to be gluten-free. I'm starting today. What do I need to do? So it, it can be very, very life-changing, and I was very fortunate that I didn't have to go through this average six to 10 years before I was diagnosed because I had a family member previously diagnosed. Well, and Dr. Simpson, I'm curious, what, what creates that, because um, another friend of mine had a similar mm -hmm. experience, um, not celiac, but mm -hmm. what creates that moment where your body really starts rejecting the gluten? You, you sort of have to think of it, you know, there's this discussion, is it an autoimmune disease, is it an allergy? And the answer is it doesn't matter, it's sort of both. Um, and what happens is like any allergy, anybody who has lived in a city for three years, all of a sudden pollen comes and you start getting allergic. Gluten is the same way. If you have a problem with it, you're okay with it for a little while, and all of a sudden your body says, you know, we're not so happy. It's like an allergy, and the more times you do it, the worse it gets and the worse it gets. You can mask it for a long time, mm -hmm. but if you look inside, it's like heart disease. You can mask it for a long time, and then boom. And I think it's the stressors that you have in your life as well that are going on. I mean, I know that with you, you said you just moved and everything, and, and the same with us, the, the time that I was feeling really bad, we had just moved, um, I changed jobs, and then my husband was diagnosed with cancer, so it was just like everything coming on. So I think the stress in your life at the time actually kickstarts it. Well, certainly, it because under stress, your whole inflammatory system goes wild, which means that if you have any allergy to anything, it's just going to be magnified. 
So, and what are specifically, um, just for someone who's not gluten-free, what are um, the foods that um, have a lot of gluten? And you said to test it out, so I'm curious, um, do you have specific foods to avoid that we wouldn't even think are the normal suspects? Beer. Mm -hmm. Like hidden sources of gluten? Yeah. yeah. You know, most packaged foods. Anything with a package. Yeah, most packaged processed. foods will have some sort of source of, you know, it, it might not be, like for example, you might think like, why aren't regular Rice Krispies gluten-free? They have gluten-free Rice Krispies. Why did they have to make that? Because they used malt flavoring. Because back when those cereals were first formulated, that was the cheapest source um, of, that was the cheapest sugar they could find. So that's what they used. Um, same thing with cornflakes. You'd think that they would be gluten-free. They're not gluten-free. Mm -hmm. It's often a source that's not necessarily traditionally from wheat. It's also, it finds its way into strange things like um, hair products frequently mm -hmm. will have lipstick. Lipstick, vital wheat gluten. The, um, uh, hand, skin cream, right, everything. It's very, that's yeah. very common. Shampoo. Um, but my feeling is if you feel like, oh, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I have to be gluten-free and I don't know what to do. If you're not even at the point where you're ready to really put things together to cook and bake, then why not just start eating just regular whole mm -hmm. foods, not grains, Pro all proteins, all vegetables, all fruits, they're all gonna be gluten-free, so you can always You know the periphery of the grocery store? Right. Yes. That middle section? That's there's, there's no real reason to be in there, but. Yeah. You know. No, it's true, the periphery is the best. And just all produce, all whole natural foods, are the best things for you, I mean, and um, don't have to go. I think uh, Jeff said that you were the first person he had met who was gluten-free. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your story and um, how you've talked to other people about it as um, well. Well, uh, people always, when I first tell people that I'm gluten-free, they say, oh my God, that must be so hard. And I say, no, it's not because, um, and I guess it, I, I've just decided this is the way I'm going to be and, and I've just gone ahead and done it. But um, if you just eat, um, like I said, whole, all natural foods, it's, it, it, it's really quite simple. And, and what I find sometimes too, because we do, a lot of, do go to a lot of events, I eat beforehand just in case, because you know what, I can't depend on somebody saying, oh yeah, sure, it's gluten-free, and then I get sick. So, you know, you tend to adjust your lifestyle a little bit um, because of, of that, but otherwise it's not that difficult, and it's not, um, you know, when people ask me, I tell them what I do, um, how I eat, um, and I, I do, uh, what, well, same with, with Nicole. Um, you take pictures of some of the foods that you have made and people say, oh, that looks so amazing. And I've actually taken like um, cookies and things to different places and they say, this is gluten-free, it can't be gluten-free, it's so good. It doesn't, gluten-free doesn't have to have be bad. It's just they, they used to make it really bad. Um, and you had nothing yeah, no other choice. Yeah, it used to be choice. really, really yeah, bad. It was. <laughs> I just would like to say something that's really important to me is that a lot of it still is really bad. Yeah. <laughs> and um, very expensive. And yes, right, and expensive, exactly. yes. Exactly. Expensive. But, yeah. And, and so, I, you know, and I will still hear on, in, in media, I will still hear people who should be much more knowledgeable and have much higher standards say, well, it's good for gluten-free. Mm -mm. If I never hear that phrase again, <laughs> good for gluten-free should be completely gone from the lexicon. It should just be good, yeah. plain good. And if it's not plain good where you can serve it, look, for me, I knew I had young children, and they were going to bring their friends over, so it couldn't just be what my son and his sisters would eat because they're hungry, they're going to eat when I give them. It had to be their friends who, especially when they're very young, they don't generally have very good manners, and they're going to say, that's disgusting, and push it away. Mm -hmm. It had mm -hmm. to pass like the snotty somebody yeah. else's kid test. Well, I know, and I had, because um, my, my daughter's gluten-free as well, and I had made her um, a chocolate, a flourless chocolate cake for her birthday party, um, and I had all the girls over, and I had the girls licking their plates. Um, it was so Why great. Why didn't you bring some? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't travel well. <laughs> um, but, uh, and it's, uh, they couldn't believe that it was gluten-free, and, and I think that's the thing that everyone thinks, is gluten-free food is not good food, and it can be. Um, you know, you don't have to buy the stuff that's out there all the time. You can actually make your own and your, your, the stuff that you make. And there are tons of recipes out there. Nicole has amazing recipes. Go to her blog. It's Thank wonderful. You. Um, you drool over the pictures, but uh, can they you, are Can real. you list what's your blog address again? Oh, sure. It's glutenfreeonashoestring.com because it doesn't have to be expensive. No. And I think a very important part of going gluten-free is having a support group to understand not only why you're going gluten-free, 
like we said, it doesn't matter if it's because you have to or if because it makes you feel better. But to have somebody to understand, and that's not going to be constantly either offering you something that's not gluten-free or to be kind of questioning what your motives are to eat gluten-free is very important. I'm lucky enough that I have family members that also have celiac disease, so I have that very, very close-knit support group in front of me. But there's a lot of people out there and online, there's so many people that eat gluten-free. Just, you know, if you check out the hashtag gluten-free, I'm sure you'll see about a million conversations going on. And even if it is online, that's a great support network to have. The other the thing is choice. this, is there are choices everywhere that mm -hmm. are gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And do yourself a favor. You know, there are certain people that, that you learn who they are because within seven seconds they'll tell you, I'm gluten-free, I'm a vegetarian, I'm an atheist, <laughs> I'm born again. The list. You know, they're, 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 they're just, you're just going to know that. And the bottom line is, don't be one of those people. You know, when you, when you, when you go somewhere, you Don't just be sort vegetarian. Of, right. <laughs> um, one of the biggest things, too, is when you're going out and um, people will say, um, if you're going to a restaurant and you ask them, you tell them that you are gluten-free. It's really important that they understand, um, especially if, you know, it's not just, you're not just doing it because you want to. Um, if you have an intolerance, intolerance or celiac, they have to understand that they can't just say it's gluten-free, it actually has to be gluten-free. They can't bring your plate out with somebody else's and, and it's, that's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand, the regulation that needs to be done for restaurants. And you know, here the, another important point is this, and we'll, again I'll talk about this more at my next little talk, but going out to restaurants is great. Stop going to crappy restaurants. <laughs> If, the rest, yeah. if it's a chain restaurant, just oh, don't you know. go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because when they it. say gluten-free, you have someone that you know doesn't even know what that means, or, and and you know it's all cooked in the same place. And so, if you're going to go out to a restaurant, which I think is great, go out to great restaurants. Mm -hmm. Not, and they're not that expensive. Right, that's not an ivory tower. I feel all. like um, it isn't. <laughs> no, not at all. Lose my reputation. <laughs> I feel like um, the whole awareness of gluten-free mm -hmm. in the last five years has become more aware and many of the kids in my, mm -hmm. um, my children's class um, now say they're gluten-free. Um, what's the best way um, to create awareness? I mean, you're doing that through a blog. Right. Um, I do feel though still when you, you know, the labeling of the gluten-free still makes people uncomfortable. Well, I, I would say that I, I don't know, we only have a, about a minute and a half left, but my feeling is that you don't need anyone else's permission. No. It would be very nice to have their cooperation. You don't need your family member's permission. You don't need anyone's permission. By the same token, take it on yourself. Empower yourself. Read as much as you possibly can. And learn filter, to cook. Learn to cook. It's learn so to easy. take care of yourself. And cook for other people as well and show them how good it can be. But don't wait for them to tell you that what you're doing is OK. Decide for yourself. And if you have a child, mm -hmm. we empowered my son very early on. And the first person, let's just put it this way, the first little kid to give him grief about it never opened up a mouth to him again. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we have a few seconds. Any last words that you want to share with anyone? One thing that would be really fun to do if you do have little ones at home that have to be gluten-free is it can be a very rough time in that school age. I was very lucky that it was after I was out of even college that I found out I had to be gluten-free. But you know, invite, your, invite their friends over, have a, mm -hmm. a cupcake party and let them taste gluten-free. Let them understand that you know, there can still be pizzas, you can still mm -hmm. have sandwiches. It's just a little different how it's made and it might taste a little bit different to no. them. But well, it should not it taste, taste different. different. <laughs> no, I mean. Well, if you follow Nicole's recipes, it will not taste different. Even bread shouldn't taste different. Yeah. yeah. It's just a matter of just experimentation more than anything else. And you know, once you get to a recipe you like, just keep with it. But it's, it's very easy. You just have to do it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.